Good morning. Uh, welcome to the first series of lecture on enzymes. Now, in the first lecture, we are just going to have a general view, overview of enzymes. So, what we are going to do in this lecture is to define what are enzymes. We are going to talk about properties of enzymes. Then we will have a general overview of structure of enzymes. And lastly, we will focus on ISOs enzymes and their clinical significance. What I have also done in this lecture is to talk about regulation of enzymes. And we will talk about the general principles of regulation such that when we move into metabolism, you can understand how different metabolic enzymes are regulated under different metabolic states. So there are a lot of ways of defining an enzyme. The simplest way is to define enzymes as catalysts for biochemical reactions in living cells. So if I want a definition of enzymes, we call them catalysts for biochemical reactions in living cells. Now majority of enzymes are proteins. However, there are some exceptions to this rule. For example, there are a number of RNA molecules with endonuclease or ligase activity. And such RNA molecules are generally known as ribozymes. So ribozymes are nucleic acids with biological catalytic activity. And since they are nucleic acids, they are not proteins. However, in general, enzymes are proteins. Now, enzymes like catalysts exhibit remarkable specificity and extraordinary catalytic power. In fact, enzymes have been found to enhance the rates of the corresponding non-catalyzed reaction by factors of at least 10 to the power 6. Highly specific with extraordinary catalytic power. Now what I want you to do is to take your textbook and you should read the nomenclature of enzymes. And why I am highlighting this is because of the fact that in the exam we will give you a reaction and ask you to classify a particular enzyme based on the reaction that is, that is catalyzed by that specific enzyme. Quickly go, going over the classification, we can classify enzymes into six classes. The first class is called an oxidoreductase, which are commonly known as dehydrogenases, reductases, or oxidases. And from the class, you can understand that these kind of enzymes catalyze addition or subtraction of electrons. The second class of enzymes are known as transferases. Commonly, they are known as kinases. Sometimes they are phosphotransferases or amino transferases depending on the chemical group they are transferring between the substrate and the end product. So transferases, if I want to give you a definition, transfer small organic groups such as the amino group or acyl group or the phosphoryl group 
or sometimes they can just transfer one carbon or even a sugar molecule. And depending on the group that they transfer, they are commonly named. For example, if a transfer is enzyme, transfers an acyl group between the substrate and the end product, we call that enzyme an acyl transferase. The third class of enzymes are known as hydrolases and commonly they are known as glycosidases, nucleases or peptidases. But whatever the common name is, the reaction that is catalyzed by such enzymes is to add water across bonds to cleave them. That means they use the general principle of hydrolysis. The fourth class known as lyases adds the elements of water, ammonia or carbon dioxide across a double bond or sometimes they catalyze the reverse reaction depending on the availability of the substrate or the product. The fifth class isomerases catalyze structural rearrangements and by now you already know what isomerism is. So isomerases catalyze structural rearrangements. Ligases catalyze the process of ligation that is they join molecules together. So this is the classification of enzymes based on the types of reaction that they catalyze. In your textbook they are discussed in much more detail and when you read the text along with this slide, it will help you to understand the mechanism better. As I mentioned, you need to know the classification because in the exam, we will give you a specific reaction and ask you the specific class to which this particular enzyme belongs based on the reaction that it catalyzes. Now each enzyme has an active site. Now how do you define an active site? It is the specific site on the enzyme which participates in substrate binding. And all enzymes will have an active site. Research shows that the active site of an enzyme predominantly consists of polar amino acids. I will repeat this. Research shows that the active site of an enzyme predominantly consists of polar or charged amino acids. And this is because presence of polar or charged amino acids facilitates ionic interactions between the active site of an enzyme and the specific substrate that it binds to. Now there are two models that you will find in your textbook as well which define the binding of substrate to the enzyme active site. The first model is popularly known as the lock and key model of enzyme substrate binding. In this model, the in enzyme to substrate binding accounts for exquisite specificity of enzyme substrate interactions. Now, 
if I want to look at it, let us look at it at this particular figure in the slide. So let us say the substrate is a key. Then the enzyme active side is the keyhole to which the substrate exquisitely and specifically binds. However, this particular binding model fails to explain the dynamic changes that occurs in the tertiary structure or the quaternary structure of the enzyme following substrate binding. So because of this drawback of the lock and key model, an enzymologist by the name of Danian Koshland proposed the induced fit model. What happens according to the induced fit model when the substrate approaches and binds to an enzyme it induces a conformational change and this conformational change can be considered to be analogous to placing a hand that is the substrate into a glove. So when we try to put our hands inside a glove, we have to move our fingers such that the glove can fit inside our hand or fit the fingers of our hand. And the induced fit model has been confirmed by a biophysical studies of enzyme motion during substrate binding. If I want to explain this with a figure, we have a substrate and let us name this substrate as AB substrate. The end product is to break AB to individual A and individual B. So the substrate comes to the active site which are these particular positions on the enzyme and when the substrate binds you can see here that there is a conformational change happening in the enzyme and this conformational change facilitates the cleavage of the bond between AB substrate such that individual A and B are released. So by the induced fit model, we are able to explain the conformational change that facilitates the conversion of the substrate to the concomitant products. Let us try to understand this with the help of an enzyme and this is called real life in vitro photography. So this is the enzyme hexokinase. We have to look at this enzyme in detail when we study glycolysis. So this is hexokinase and the substrate for hexokinase is the glucose molecule. You already know that glucose is a carbohydrate, specifically an aldohexose. So enzyme E, hexokinase, substrate S, glucose. So what happens is, if we look at it in real time, when glucose binds to hexokinase, you can see that there is a considerable conformational change taking place in the enzyme hexokinase, which is actually responsible for the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. That's the product. So we go back 
this is hexokinase, this is the substrate glucose, this is the active site and when glucose binds to the active site, you can see here there is a conformational change happening in the tertiary structure of the enzyme hexokinase which facilitates the binding of glucose to hexokinase. And in the subsequent step, which is not shown here, glucose will be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. And in the process, hexokinase will chemically undergo no modification, whereas glucose will undergo a process called phosphorylation. So hexokinase is the enzyme because it is a biological catalyst that facilitates the phosphorylation of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And in the process of binding to glucose, the tertiary structure of the enzyme undergoes considerable conformational modifications. So this actually proves that enzyme to substrate binding happens according to the induced fit model and not the lock and key model. Now, before I go forward, I would like to talk a bit about, let us say, soccer. So, you in soccer, sometimes we also call it the football, not uh, the American football, but the British football. In soccer, we have a ball, and this ball, during a penalty kick, has to go inside the goal. Now if I leave the ball and the player does not kick the ball, the ball will be staying at its position for an indefinite period of time. What the player does is to kick the ball thereby facilitating the movement of the ball according to a defined path and ultimately the ball enters the goal. So in enzyme catalyzed reaction the ball is the substrate. The entry of the ball inside the goal is the product and the kick that is provided by the player is the enzyme. So when the substrate is converted to the product, the player itself chemically remains unchanged. There is no physical change or chemical change happening in the player. Similarly, in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, the enzyme does not undergo any kind of chemical change. So what it is doing is, it is facilitating the conversion of the substrate to the product. Now let us translate this observation. And before we do that, we need to define a couple of stuff. First is, the energy of activation. Sorry about this uh, red highlights. So before a chemical reaction can take place, the reactants must become activated, which is the kick of the footballer that the ball is receiving. So analogous to the kick of the footballer, which the substrate or the ball is receiving. 
So this kick has a certain energy and this energy can be defined as energy of activation. So I reiterate, before a chemical reaction can take place, the reactants must become activated. For this activation, a certain amount of energy is required, which is termed as energy of activation. And if I want to define energy of activation, it is defined as the minimum amount of energy which is required of a molecule to take part in a reaction. Let us take an example, a real life example. For example, we have the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and if I do not have a biological catalyst or an enzyme, it has an energy of activation of about 18,000. I'm not mentioning the unit, but it's the unit of energy. So I would like you to focus on the numerical part in this particular slide. So the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide without a catalyst has an energy of activation of about 18,000. I add an enzyme catalase and the energy of activation is less than 2000. So the rate of the reaction is proportional to the energy of activation. Greater the energy of activation, slower will be the reaction while if the energy of activation is less, the reaction will be faster. So when I add catalysts in the reaction environment, I am reducing the energy of activation to 2000. From 18,000 to 2000. Therefore, when I add catalysts, the reaction rate will be faster. And that's what enzyme does. It reduces the energy of activation. It provides the kick to the ball so that it can enter the goal. We talked about this with an example of soccer. So I'm just drawing a parallel here. The enzyme reduces the energy of activation, which augments the rate of the reaction. In the presence of the enzyme, the rate of the reaction is faster. And this is described here with the example of catalase and hydrogen peroxide. So what does the enzyme specifically do? So let us take an example. We have a stick, a metal stick. And we need to break the stick into two halves. So enzyme, sorry, the substrate is the stick. The product is to convert the stick into two pieces. In order to convert the stick to two pieces, I need to bend the stick. If I do not have any kind of catalyst, the probability of the stick breaking on itself into two halves is very slim because it has a very high energy of activation. 
So the rate of the reaction is very slow. So what I do here, I use a magnet, a magnet such that it can hold the stick and also bend the stick such that the stick can be broken into two pieces from the center. So we have the substrate and then we have the enzyme substrate complex where the stick and the magnet are together. Now what it does, it slowly facilitates the bending of the stick. So this is the enzyme substrate complex. And after forming the enzyme substrate complex, as we saw in case of hexokinase, there is a conformational change happening. You can see the conformational change here. There is a conformational change happening such that the stick is getting bent and ultimately the stick is broken from the middle into two pieces and that's the product. We started with the stick then we used the magnets that is the enzyme which bound to the stick. After binding the enzyme or the magnet undergoes a conformational change which facilitates the bending of the stick and ultimately the stick is broken from the middle into two halves. So what the enzyme has done here is that by forming the enzyme substrate complex it has lowered the energy of activation increasing the rate of the reaction that is the conversion of the stick into two pieces. So enzyme lowers the energy of activation. Again sorry for this uh, red highlights I do not know why they are not going away but just ignore them for the time being. So what I mentioned here, this is the energy of activation for an uncatalyzed reaction. What enzyme does is to lower the energy of activation such that the conversion of substrate to product is facilitated. But what we should also remember is that there is no difference in the free energy of the overall reaction that is the energy of reactants minus the energy of the products between the catalyzed and the uncatalyzed reaction. So in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, there is no difference in the delta G or free energy of the overall reaction, that is the energy of reactants minus energy of products. So this we have to remember. So the enzyme just lowers the energy of activation or the free energy of activation. The presence of an enzyme has no effect on the free energy of the overall reaction. That is the energy of reactants minus energy of products. This is very, very important. Although we do not ask free energy problems, but at least you should be able to explain the concept of energy of activation and understand that there is no difference in the free energy of the overall reaction between the catalyzed 
and uncatalyzed reactions. Now we come to enzyme regulation. Now what I am going to do in this particular lecture and what I have done in this lecture actually is to borrow slides from some of my close colleagues who teach enzyme chemistry in other um, universities and these slides gives you a global overview of enzyme regulation. I have included these slides because by providing you with the global overview, you will be able to understand the regulation of metabolic enzymes when we talk about them in the lectures related to specific metabolic pathways. So I would like to thank some of my friends here who have provided me with their slides and I have also put in the book which were used in making these slides. Of course, you do not need to buy the book or read it, but this is just a reference. So if you have time and if you are interested in going through the book, I can give it to you as I have a copy of this book and you can have a look at it. I don't know if this book is in the library. You need to check with the librarian. So the rates of enzyme catalyzed reactions are controlled by regulatory enzymes that increase the reaction rate when more of a particular substance is needed and decrease the reaction rate when the substance is not needed. Take for example, I have excess glucose and glucose therefore requires to be metabolized. Therefore, hexokinase will become active and convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. <coughs> Sorry. I have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate and then I need to stop the reaction and the enzyme hexokinase then will become inactive. How does this regulation happen? Of course, hexokinase has a definite regulatory mechanism and I will talk about this when we touch on the lecture on glycolysis. But basically, if I want to look at the regulation of enzymes, I can classify them into three types. The first one is called allosteric regulation. The second one is called feedback control. And the third one is known as covalent modifications. So I reiterate broadly, enzyme regulation can be classified into allosteric regulation feedback control and covalent modification. In the exam, we can give you a scenario and ask you what kind of regulation you are observing for a specific enzyme. So if you understand the basic principles of enzyme regulation, you can answer it very easily. We start with the first one, the allosteric regulation. Now, first we need to understand the concept of allosteric site. And this particular concept is very important. And why it is important? Because the concept of allosteric site is also required in order to describe non-competitive inhibition and this particular part we will come and discuss in detail when we talk about enzyme inhibition. So in enzymes or let us say in specific enzymes 
there is a site other than the active site so there is a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site which binds regulatory molecules and this specific site is known as the allosteric site. So don't get confused here. Allosteric site does not, and I'm reiterating this, does not bind substrates. It binds regulatory molecules. The site on the enzyme that binds substrate is the active site. So allosteric site is different from the active site. What happens if some entity occupies the allosteric site is that it causes a change in the shape of the active site. If I want to define it, the allosteric site regulates the conformational shape of the active site. I reiterate this, the allosteric site regulates the conformational shape of the active site. But please remember, the allosteric site is different from the active site. And if somebody asks you, where does the substrate bind? The answer is it binds to the active site, not the allosteric site. So let us say I have a molecule which binds to the allosteric site and induces a conformational change in the active site such that it allows the substrate to bind more effectively. Such an entity is called a positive allosteric regulator. So, so such an entity is called a positive allosteric regulator. So a positive allosteric regulator changes the shape of the active site such that it allows the substrate to bind more effectively. Similarly, if we have a positive regulator, we will always have a negative regulator. If an entity binds to the active site, uh, allosteric site such that it changes the conformational shape of the active site to prevent the proper binding of the substrate to the enzyme, thereby decreasing the rate of the catalyzed reaction, we call it a negative regulator. Binding to the allosteric site helps in the binding of the substrate to the active site, positive regulator. Binding to the allosteric site hinders the binding of the substrate to the active site. We call it a negative regulator. But in both cases, the underlying common mechanism is that there is a change in the conformational shape. Let us look at it with a diagram. So we have two sites and I told you this before. We have an allosteric site and we have the active site. Active site binds to the substrate. The allosteric site binds to a regulatory molecule. So let us take this regulatory molecule. It binds to the allosteric site. 
and there is a conformational change in the enzyme in the active site which facilitates the binding of the substrate to the active site and the rate of the reaction is increased leading to the formation of products. So this particular regulator is a positive allosteric regulator and this phenomena is defined as positive allosteric regulation. We take the second scenario. We have an enzyme. We have the allosteric site. We have the active site. We have a regulatory molecule. The regulatory molecule binds to the allosteric site, induces a conformational change in the active site, such that the substrate now cannot bind to the active site and the rate of the reaction is decreased and therefore this particular regulator is called a negative allosteric regulator and the phenomena is defined as negative allosteric regulation. So a positive regulator changes the shape of the active site allowing the substrate to bind more effectively increasing the re reaction rate. A negative regulator changes the shape of the active site preventing the binding of the substrate and decreasing the reaction rate. Positive allosteric regulation facilitates substrate binding. Negative allosteric regulation impairs substrate binding. And we came to know about another site on the enzyme which is different from the substrate binding active site and this particular site is called the allosteric site and binding of a regulatory molecule to the allosteric site induces conformational change in the active site. We come to the second type of control which we call the feedback control. Feedback meaning the products themselves regulate the binding of the substrate to the enzyme. As I told you when I want glucose 6-phosphate the hexokinase activity will be augmented or facilitated. When I don't want glucose 6-phosphate, the activity of hexokinase will be impaired. And this particular principle holds true for any enzyme. Otherwise, we will have uncontrolled enzyme activity and the whole homeostasis will be disturbed. So in feedback control when the end product is high the end product acts as a negative regulator and binds to the allosteric site. Under such situation, the substrate cannot bind to the active site and production of all of the intermediate compounds such as the enzyme substrate complex stops. So the product acts as a negative allosteric regulator. By now, you already know what a negative allosteric regulator is.
To better understand this, let us take this particular diagram and try to look at what I just said. So this is an enzyme E1, a hypothetical enzyme. This is the active site which binds the substrate. Of course, the enzyme has another site which is the allosteric site. The enzyme E1 binds to substrate S, leading to the formation of the green square which is the product. This product that is the green square is the substrate for a second enzyme, enzyme E2. On binding of the green square to the enzyme E2, we get the third product, the violet colored squarish entity. This particular entity is the substrate for another enzyme E3. It binds to the active site of E3 leading to the formation of the product. This product now goes back and binds to the allosteric site in enzyme E1. As a result of which the conformation of the active site of enzyme E1 is altered and the substrate cannot bind. What I just described here using this diagram is a pathway where the final product of the pathway acts as a negative allosteric regulator for the first enzyme in the pathway. So by impairing the first enzyme in the pathway, I can regulate the activity of the complete pathway. So here the product is a negative regulator for enzyme E1. Since the substrate now cannot bind to enzyme E1 when the product is bound to the enzyme, the whole pathway is stopped. So in feedback control, when the level of end product is low, that means level of this particular entity is low, the regulator dissociates from the allosteric site. As a result, the active site has a conformation that can effectively bind to the substrate. And the whole process from E1 through E2 to E3 can occur. And once we have enough of the end product, the end product acts as a negative allosteric regulator. To stop the operation of the complete pathway. So in feedback control, the end product binds to a regulatory site on the first enzyme in the reaction sequence which prevents the formation of all intermediate compounds needed in the synthesis of the end product. And I told you this is a general occurrence in most of the metabolic pathways and that is the reason I have included, this, uh, included these slides on enzyme regulation.
Now we go to the next type of enzyme regulation, which is called covalent modification. Now covalent modification is another way in which the enzymes are chemically modified. Now when we talk about covalent modification or chemical modification, please understand that in our case, this covalent modification is reversible. Why I'm highlighting this? Because when we talk about covalent modification with regards to enzyme inhibition, such inhibition is irreversible. So what happens is in covalent modification, enzyme activity is modified by covalent bonds to a group on the polypeptide chain that are formed or broken. And the classical example of covalent modification can be cited in our system using the example of zymogens or proenzymes. Now zymogens are produced in their inactive form and can be activated at a later time when they are needed. So I have a proenzyme which is inactive. The proenzyme undergoes a chemical modification and becomes active. And this is observed in our human body in case of many enzymes. And such enzymes are especially the digestive enzymes and the blood clotting enzymes. Let us take some examples. I am not going to ask you the names of these enzymes except for the fact that you should understand the principle of covalent modification. So we have a proenzyme chymotrypsinogen. This enzyme or the proenzyme is produced by the pancreas but it is activated inside the small intestine by covalent modification to chymotrypsin and they will talk about the function of this enzyme in the course of digestion and nutrition. Similarly, in blood clotting, we have an enzyme called prothrombin. Prothrombin is inactive in the blood, but when we have damaged tissues, that means when we have a cut, prothrombin is chemically activated to thrombin. In this case, as well as in this case, the proenzyme becomes the active enzyme by covalent modification. I hope this is clear. So the activation of proenzymes to active enzymes involves covalent modification. Let us take an, another example. And this is something that you should focus on. Because in our course, we will come across several enzymes, especially those involved in glycogen metabolism, which follow this particular mechanism of activation. We have an inactive enzyme. Let us take this particular enzyme. And this particular enzyme is converted to its active form by addition of a phosphate group. In order for the conversion of the inactive enzyme to the active enzyme, we require another enzyme which is called a kinase. 
the kinase catalyzes the conversion of the inactive enzyme to the active enzyme by the addition of a phosphate to the inactive enzyme and the process is called phosphorylation. As I told you, enzyme remains unchanged in the whole process of this phosphorylation and therefore the phosphate comes from ATP which is converted to ADP after the product. So ATP adenosine triphosphate, ADP adenosine diphosphate. In this case, there are three phosphates. One phosphate is transferred to the inactive enzyme, which now becomes active. And in the process, ATP is converted to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And this particular process is catalyzed by a class of enzymes known as kinases. So one enzyme helps in the activation of another enzyme. <coughs> and I told you, this is a general principle that we are talking about here, but we will see specific examples in the metabolic pathways. And this particular phosphorylation of an inactive enzyme to an active enzyme is observed for enzymes which participate in glycogen metabolism. So here we are taking an inactive enzyme, phosphorylating it and we are making it into an active enzyme. Does the reverse happen? That means the inactive enzyme has a phosphate and the active enzyme is dephosphorylated. That means the phosphate is removed. The answer is yes. So we have an inactive enzyme which is phosphorylated. We take away the phosphate using hydrolysis. That is you, we use water. In the process phosphate is released. The enzyme becomes active. And the class of enzymes that catalyzes this particular reaction are called phosphatases. So phosphatases are enzymes which facilitate the hydrolysis of phosphate groups from the substrate. In this case, the substrate is an inactive enzyme which is phosphorylated. Hydrolysis of the phosphate group leads to the activation of the inactive enzyme. In both the cases of kinases and phosphatases, we are either helping in the formation of covalent bonds or facilitating the breakage of covalent bonds and therefore this kind of enzyme regulation can be classified as covalent regulation. So phosphorylation is a process by which many enzymes are either activated. We require another enzyme for this activation which is a kinase. Dephosphorylation is facilitated by another enzyme called phosphatase which actually takes away a phosphate group from the inactive enzyme to make it active. And as I told you, this particular mechanism you will observe 
in many metabolic pathways, especially the pathways associated with glycogen metabolism, that is glycogenesis, that is synthesis of glycogen, or glycogenolysis, that is breakdown of glycogen. So, in other years, we don't talk about the process of enzyme regulation and we try to visit them when we talk about specific metabolic pathways, but I wanted them to be introduced early in, in this year so that when we talk about the metabolic pathways, you can apply these general principles and then it will give you a better understanding of these metabolic pathways that we will talk about for subsequent length of time in the course of biochemistry. Now we come to something called factors that affect enzyme activity. And of course the first factor that we will talk about is temperature. So if I raise the temperature, so I have a test tube in which I have taken a fixed concentration of enzyme and of course a fixed concentration of substrate. As I raise the temperature, the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction increases and you know why because by raising the temperature there is an increase in the kinetic energy and collision frequency between the enzyme and the substrate. So as I increase the temperature, so let us look at this graph, so I keep on increasing the temperature, and the reaction velocity increases because there is an increase in the collision frequency between the enzyme and the substrate. This is understandable, but after increasing the temperature to a certain extent, I see that there is a drop in enzyme activity. And this drop, which I observe in this part of the plot, is because of the fact that as I keep on increasing the temperature, the energy from heat also increases the kinetic energy of the enzyme. And the tertiary structure of the enzyme gets also unstable. Remember we talked about the non-covalent interactions that participate in the tertiary structure of a protein. So as I keep on increasing the heat, the kinetic energy of the enzyme also increases. And after a certain point, the non-covalent interaction that maintain the three-dimensional structure of the enzymes are disrupted. So basically, the enzyme starts unfolding. And we talked about this when we talked about denaturation of proteins. So we can see, say here that as I increase the temperature, enzyme activity will increase However, after a certain extent, rise in temperature will lead to denaturation of the enzyme, leading to decrease in enzyme activity, which is reflected here in reaction velocity, because the enzyme is now completely becoming dysfunctional. Now, <laughs> We have a specific entity called the Q10, which is known as the temperature coefficient. The Q10 or temperature coefficient is the factor by which the rate of a biological process increases for a 10 degree Celsius increase in temperature. Let us say for temperatures over which enzymes are stable, the rates of most biological processes typically doubles 
for a 10 degree centigrade rise in temperature. And therefore, the temperature coefficient Q10 is equal to 2. Of course, in this course, we will ask you simple problems using this particular coefficient. So how do you calculate it? Q10 is calculated by the following formula. Remember, Q10 does not have any unit. It has a single entity. And the reason is, if you look at it, this particular formula, you can derive it yourself. And I would like you to do this exercise at home. Why doesn't Q10 have any kind of unit? So I defined Q10, which is the factor by which the reaction rate increases when the temperature is raised by 10 degrees. And Q10 is a unitless quantity, which is equal to the ratio of R2 and R1. So R1 is the measured reaction rate at temperature T1. R2 is the measured reaction rate at temperature T2. And of course, remember that T2 is greater than T1. And T1 is the temperature at which you have measured R1. And remember this thing that if you are looking at the temperature, you need to convert it either to Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvin. You cannot use other units like Fahrenheit. So if somebody gives you temperatures in Fahrenheit, you need to convert them to Celsius. So the formula for that is C by 5 is equal to F minus 32 by 9. C, temperature in Celsius. F, temperature in Fahrenheit. This particular formula holds only true for units of temperature expressed in Celsius or Kelvin. So again, we talked about looking at units when we talked about solubility problems. Similarly, when you are calculating Q10, you also need to look at the te tem temperature units. And if the temperature are uh, mentioned in Fahrenheit, you can convert them to Celsius and then do the math. And these are very simple problems. I will upload some practice problems for you in the self-test so that you can practice these problems associated with the calculation of temperature coefficient. The next factor we talked about is pH. Now, Prof. Riyadh has talked about how does pH affect the charges on amino acids. So, Enzymes are proteins consisting of amino acids. The side chains are sensitive to changes in pH. Therefore, any changes in pH will also affect enzyme activity. So pH will affect protonation or deprotonation of amino acid side chains. And this will affect the binding between the enzyme and the substrate especially if the protonation or the deprotonation happens at the active site. Even if it doesn't have happen at the active site, it will still affect substrate binding because there will be conformational change happening in the enzyme associated with changes in pH will, will, which will affect the geometry of the active site. Extreme changes in pH will affect the higher levels of enzyme structure. So if I put something at very high or low pH, it will affect the tertiary or the quaternary structure of the enzyme. And this will affect substrate binding. In other words, it will affect enzyme activity. Unlike temperature, we do not have a formula for 
correlating pH with enzyme activity because the pH at which maximal enzyme activity is achieved is different for different enzymes. Let us take an enzyme pepsin present in our gastric juice which has a very low pH of approximately 2 and this particular enzyme is active at very low pH. Similarly, we have alkaline phosphatase and you can see here from the curve alkaline phosphatase as the name suggests is approximately active somewhere around 10. So this is a particular enzyme that is active at an alkaline pH. So we cannot, we do not have an expression to correlate pH with enzyme activity. Each enzyme has a specific pH at which it has maximal activity. However, drastic changes in pH will affect enzyme activity as it will affect the tertiary and quaternary structure of the enzyme. Now we have to define certain terms and these terms are very important because they are often asked in the assessment. When I started the lecture, I talked about enzymes having, enzymes being proteins, except ribozymes. But certain enzymes also have non-protein entities associated with them. So let us first talk about holoenzyme. So holoenzyme refers to the active enzyme with its non-protein component. The term apoenzyme is referred to as the inactive enzyme without its non-protein part. If the non-protein part is a metal ion such as zinc or iron, it is called a cofactor and if the non-protein part is a small organic molecule, it is termed as a coenzyme. Let us try to have a look at this particular schematic figure, again borrowed from the slides of one of my friends. So this is the holoenzyme, that means with everything, holoenzyme, the whole enzyme. Apoenzyme, the protein part of the enzyme. Then we have the cofactor and we define cofactor as the non-protein part which is mostly a metal ion. So if I want to label this for this particular slide, let us label this as the zinc ion. So this is the cofactor. And then if I have an organic molecule, then we have the coenzyme. This is the organic molecule. I'm just abbreviating it as OM. This is the catalytic site of the enzyme. And as you can see here, both the cofactor and the coenzyme are required for the maintenance of the active site geometry. This is the protein part of the enzyme. So this is the apoenzyme. So apoenzyme plus coenzyme plus cofactor is called the holoenzyme. I repeat, apoenzyme plus the coenzyme plus the cofactor is referred to as the holoenzyme. Apo, co, cofactor and the holoenzyme. This should be very clear in your mind because sometimes we'll ask you definition and the difference between cofactor and coenzyme and you should be able to answer it because these are knowledge-based questions 
which you should not miss. Now we have two other definitions that we need to know. Coenzymes that only transiently associate with the enzyme are called co-substrates. That means they were not permanently associated with the structure of the enzyme. But they transiently bind to the enzyme, increasing the rate of the reaction and after the reaction is over, they dissociate from the enzyme. In our course, you will see a lot of them and they are NAD+, NADP, FAD and FM, FMN. Nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide phosphate, flavin, adenine, dinucleotide, flavin, mononucleotide. So these are co-substrates that transiently bind to the enzyme and once the whole process is over, they dissociate from the enzyme. And in our course, when we talk about electron transport chain, we have this particular pathway that we will be talking about. You will see that these co-substrates act by donating or accepting hydrogen atoms or electrons. That's the reason I wanted to introduce these entities early when I'm talking about enzymes, such that you can understand the processes better. So they either help by donating or accepting hydrogen atoms or electrons, or they help in the transfer of groups other than hydrogen. We do not have, to the best of my knowledge, any co-substrate in our course that deals with transfer of groups. But most of the studies that we will pursue in our course deals with the donation or accept um, to by donation or or by accepting hydrogen atoms or electrons. Now, if the coenzyme is permanently associated with the enzyme and returned to its original form after the reaction is over, we call that coenzyme a prosthetic group. Co-substrates, they transiently associate. Prosthetic groups are coenzymes that are permanently associated with the enzyme. And you will see these kind of examples when we talk about specific enzymes in the metabolic pathway. But the factor, sorry, the part for co-substrates is very important and I am highlighting this for the pathway which we know, which we know as the electron transport chain. We have this particular metabolic pathway and there you will see the function of co-substrates. We come to the last part of the lecture focusing on isoenzymes. In many textbooks, they are also written as isozymes. Isoenzymes are the same as isozymes. So what are isoenzymes? Very simply, enzymes which catalyze the same reaction but have different primary structure. You know what primary structure is. We discussed this extensively in lecture 4. So enzymes which catalyze the same reaction but have different primary structure are defined as isoenzymes. I will give you an example that we will study when we come to glycolysis. 
hexokinase and glucokinase they are isoenzymes because both hexokinase and glucokinase convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate so they have the same substrate they catalyze the same reaction but the primary structure or the sequence of amino acids of hexokinase is different from glucokinase if you are interested you can check it by going on to the protein data bank website which i showed you for one of our classes isoenzymes enzymes which catalyze the same reaction but have different primary structures now why are they important why should we study them because different organs frequently contain characteristic proportions of different isoenzymes and the pattern of isoenzymes found in the plasma may therefore serve as a means of identifying the site of tissue damage this will become clear as we take an example of an enzyme that catalyzes the same reaction but in different tissues have different forms <coughs> in terms of the fact that these forms have different sequence of amino acids or different primary structure we take lactate dehydrogenase again a very very important enzyme we will talk about this very soon now in glycolysis it has five possible forms in the blood serum so five different isoenzymes means five different lactate dehydrogenases they catalyze the same chemical reaction but they have different primary structure now i chose lactate dehydrogenase because you will see the clinical importance of this enzyme as we go through the next couple of slides now lactate dehydrogenase consists of four polypeptide chains that means if i want to revisit my knowledge on protein structure lactate dehydrogenase has four different polypeptide chains that means it has a quaternary structures quaternary structure sorry if I look at the polypeptide chains and classify them according to their primary structure, then there are two types. In older textbooks, they are called A and B. But now, we have removed the older convention of naming these chains and labeled them as M and H. M stands for muscle, H for heart, and we will see these forms in the next few slides. So LDH or lactate dehydrogenase has five isozymes distributed in different tissues. Lactate dehydrogenase has a quaternary structure consisting of four polypeptide chains, which are of two types either M type or H type. So let us take the first example. I have all H polypeptide chains. That means I have four polypeptide chains, all of the H variety or the heart variety. As I can see here, all four polypeptide chains are of the H type. When I talk about H and or heart, that means this particular form of the enzyme is predominantly present in the heart and to some extent in the kidneys. Whereas when I talk about 
H3M. That means three of the genes are of H variety, H type, and one of M type, and that particular form is predominantly present in the erythrocytes or the red blood cells. So here I have four polypeptide chains. The primary structure of all the chains are the same for this particular form. When I come here, I have three H chains. That means the primary structure is the same for the three H, but different for the M. And this particular form is present in the red blood cells. And as we go to the next slide, we will see the clinical relevance of knowing these subtypes. So we come to this particular slide. So this is a slide that I prepared myself. So let us look at it. We have the first variety of lactate dehydrogenase and the different forms are called isoforms. So the first type LDH1 consisting of four H polypeptide chains mostly present in the myocardium or the heart. So if there is damage to the heart tissue, so this is the heart, if I have a damage in the myocardium, this particular enzyme will be, or this particular form of the enzyme will be released into the blood. And by doing a blood test, I can then say that in this particular individual, there has been an injury to the heart tissue. This is also resistant to heat. So if I look at the property of this isoform, this is resistant to heat, moves fast when I look at it under in an electric field. The next isoform is called LDH2. We looked at this, we have H3M1, that means three polypeptide chains of the H variety, one of the M variety, present mostly in RBC and also to some extent in the kidney. So if somebody is suffering from some kind of disorder of the kidney or the erythrocyte, then I will see or observe this particular isoform in the blood. LDH3 consisting of two H polypeptides and two M polypeptides predominantly present in the brain and used as a marker for leukemia and malignancy, especially malignancy of the brain. LDH4 consisting of one H polypeptide and three M polypeptides predominantly present in the lung and if there is a pulmonary infarction where there is damage of the lung tissue you will observe this particular form in the blood. LDH5 consisting of all M polypeptide chains. So if you look at it, this particular isoform and this particular isoform, this consists of all four H chains, this consists of all four M chains, presently, uh, predominantly present in the skeletal muscle, as well as to some extent in the liver. So if there is any injury to the skeletal muscle, this particular isoform will be present in the blood. So I think you have got the idea. Five different isoforms with different primary structure. 
in terms of the composition of the polypeptide chains and each of these isoforms are present in specific tissues and damage to a specific tissue will elevate the level of a specific isoform in the blood helping us to diagnose the site of injury but in general only LDH1 and LDH5 are commonly used. LDH1 is used in order to detect myocardial infarction that means there is a damage to the myocardium and then this particular isoform is elevated in the blood as the isoform leaks out of the myocardium coming inside the blood and LDH5 which is predominantly present in the skeletal muscle any injury to the skeletal muscle will release this isoform from the muscle cells into the blood and the level of this isoform will be elevated which will help us to identify if the person has suffered any skeletal muscle injury so by looking at the specific isoform we are able to localize the specific site of injury so what i want you to do is to look at two more proteins ck and troponin which are used for the detection of myocardial infarction and these two proteins you should refer to in your book i may ask you questions on this so please read them please make notes and if you have any difficulty please come to me and we will clarify the doubts that brings us to the end of the first lecture on enzymes this particular lecture i believe has provided with an over provided you with an overview of enzymes how they are regulated how they function you have you now know what is an active site what is an allosteric site we have also looked at how temperature and ph affect enzyme activity we looked at temperature coefficient and i will upload some problems so that you can practice them on temperature coefficient and lastly we have also looked at isoenzymes or isozymes we have talked in detail about lactate dehydrogenase and the different isoforms and how they are used in order to identify specific clinical conditions please read your book at those points where i have mentioned in my lecture you will require the knowledge for that require the knowledge because i will i may ask you questions on that and in the next lecture we will talk a, a bit about enzyme kinetics but predominantly enzyme kinetics will be dealt in the lecture on enzyme inhibition Thank you for listening.